Thanks away. Um, just, I just want to share a little bit about me. If you haven't uh, seen me online or you have not uh, looked me up, my name is Dr. William Clark, and I'm originally from Philadelphia. We were talking about that earlier today. Yes, I was born and raised there. I did not spend the most of my days in the playground, so don't sing the song in your head. Uh, but I grew up in Philadelphia, moved here to Connecticut four years ago uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, we moved here, we sold everything we had uh, to pastor uh, here, uh, which is a whole story. Uh, but as a part of that journey, I ended up uh, running a couple of nonprofits. And I'm currently running a nonprofit based out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, I have over uh, 15 years of experience doing a ton of stuff. That includes nonprofits, uh, governmental work, for profit work, grant writing, etc. And I've just been fortunate to uh, have a career that has been um, on the incline. And um, I'm very thankful for that. And so, uh, because of that, I'm here and able to share with you uh, what I believe is good information that can really help you uh, along your journey of obtaining either your first grant or sustaining your nonprofit with a series of grants. Uh, I have an earned doctorate degree. Uh, it's a distinction I, I like to call out uh, from Regent University. It's in strategic leadership, so I'm a leadership guy, I'm a strategy guy, I'm an organizational behavior and psychology guy. So, that's my background. Uh, I have a master's degree in leadership development from Penn State University um, in a process in some point in my lifetime finishing up a, another master's in uh, master's divinity and leadership uh, before I die. Uh, so hopefully <laughs> that gets done. It's kicking my behind. And uh, I do want to just call out the schools that I went to really quickly just in case anybody is looking to finish their education. These are schools obviously I attended, I endorse felt like it's my civic duty to uh, highlight the schools that I'm a part of because they've been a benefit to me. Uh, you can access all of my resources on the website on, your web, uh, on the screen. Now, you can get them from Amazon. However, the honest truth is, uh, if you get it from my personal website that's listed there, uh, most of the proceeds, the majority of them come to me. So if you want to be a help, a blessing, a contributor, supporter, whatever you want to call it, go to that website. Um, I do have a free copy of my book here that I do want to give away, and we'll do this the democratic way. If you can guess the month I am born, um, then you will get this free copy of my book. If there are a couple people who guess close to the same month or the same exact month, then we'll figure out another way to break the tie. So we'll start here with you, ma'am. What month do you think I'm born in? Hope this is a blessing to you. Thank you. Close. Not a Pisces. <laughs> Not a Pisces. I'm not sure if I should be insulted, but okay. But I hope that book is helpful. If you did not get a copy of this book, Grant Writing 101, which is the inspiration of this workshop, Mark has a copy waiting for you at the front desk for a reasonable contribution. Uh, let me go back really quickly. I do want to talk about these other resources and how they define me. This book, Grant Writing 101, has what I believe some tips and tricks that have made a difference uh, in my career, made a difference in the business that I run now. Uh, that's all over the state of Connecticut. There are some significant tips and tricks. We will cover some of them today. But uh, the seminal work of my doctoral research, my career, my philosophy is the green book on the screen, Sustainable. That book was written out of uh, a point of time in my life where chaos ensued. My, my church in Philadelphia in 2011 was involved in a hurricane called Irene. And uh, that, the story of that still gives me chills. I was in the bed 5 o'clock in the morning and my father calls me. And my, uh, but he called me crying. He called me crying because Hurricane Irene was, was kind of on the tail end of a couple of summer storms in 2011. And he called me and said, there's a hole in the wall. And I'm like, dude, what are you, what are you talking about? There's a hole in the wall. I, now, I know we got some Christians in the room. Christians, believers, yeah? Everybody's a believer in here? You, you a believer, man? Hmm? You a Christian? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to share this reference. When you think about... Um, uh, uh, Jesus and, and, and the stone was rolled away. Can you, you know, you just think about the imagery of a large stone removed from the gravesite. If you can imagine that, that's what my church looked like. There was a gaping hole in the side of a mountain or the side of the church. And it was unbelievable because the church I grew up in, the church my father raised me and my brother in, where people were baptized, buried, and married, literally had a hole in the wall. And all you can see were the floors caved in like a V. The basement where we were the night before preparing for a funeral of a beloved uh, church member uh, was now flooded with water. 
the choir stand, the pulpit I preached from was now sunken into the water. And that was the same year I started my uh, doctoral work and my son was born that same year. So we had to go through this process of figuring out what's next for the church. And if you've never been through that, it's a tough situation where you're trying to democratically decide to help your pastor at the time, or my pastor at the time, what to do. And so when I started to study leadership, there were multiple inspirations behind that. But the biggest inspiration was, how do I help this church sustain? Because I knew in 2011, I was moving to Connecticut. I moved here in 2014, so I had three years out. And I had to get this old family church in a place where it can sustain without me. And this book, my research, my work, is a seminal work of how to understand how to sustain your nonprofit. Today, we're going to talk about grant writing. And listen, the grants are cool. Grants uh, will, will accelerate your business and help you do things, open doors. But as you will hear in a moment, it is very competitive. And if it's competitive, if you believe what I'm saying, then you have to have alternative methods of revenue generation for your church, your nonprofit, et cetera. And so that book gives you principles, both biblical and secular, on how to think about sustainability for your ministry, your church, your nonprofit, et cetera. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears that came along with that book. Uh, Leadership for Development for Nonprofits is a simple, quick read. It's a book. Um, I have one for churches as well, but it's a quick read on how to develop leaders in your sphere of influence. So if that's something up your alley, you might want to grab that book. And then also Leverage, my very first book. That book is also personal. That book uh, is a story about a kid who went to college and realized from day one he was at a disadvantage. And he had to figure out how to create opportunity from absolutely nothing. Now, for y'all who are Bible readers and believers, again, there's some substance in there. You might really, really like it. But for those of you who really aren't into that stuff, I do cover non-biblical elements in that. But if you want to grab a copy of those books, you can go on my website. You can get them from Amazon, but preferably, if you can, uh, visit my website at gumroad.com forward slash Dr. William P. Clark. I do want to thank my sponsors before we get started. Uh, my first sponsor is my church, Living Faith Church. If you, uh, you look around, there's information about Living Faith there. Um, they've been gracious enough to share this space here. This space where we are is where Living Faith worships. Uh, if you're in the area, feel free to stop by. Our information is on the back of the card, so I do want to thank Living Faith. I also want to thank Eli Patrick. You have information on them as well. It's a consulting company that helps nonprofits figure out how to do their work better from leadership development, organization development, and grant writing. And I do also want to thank Willis Dawson, the publisher uh, of this book and all of my books. Um, so just a huge shout out to both of uh, all three of those uh, organizations. If you can support them any way you can, please do so. Just as a, as a precursor to tell you a little bit more about me and why you may have decided to sign up for this course, I do want to show you my track record. In 2018 alone, this is a, a small number, I raised a little over $300,000 uh, for my current organization. I do not have the totals for 2019, so don't judge me. But in 2018, I raised $300,000. In 2017, I raised over $1.3 million. Uh, dollars in grant resources. In three years total, um, I raised over $3 million and it's still counting. And then uh, in Philadelphia, before I moved here, I was working for the city of Philadelphia mayor and uh, was overseeing economic development for the city of Philadelphia, focusing on minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and disabled-owned businesses to make sure there was an equitable stake in the, in the uh, economic boom in Philadelphia. And under my portfolio, I oversaw $4.5 billion in economic development. So a lot of my philosophy from that time in Philadelphia and grant writing is going to be infused in what you'll hear today. So it's not just uh, from a bubble standpoint of what you got to do to get a grant, but uh, you know how to run a successful business. Now, this presentation is on the website, so you can follow there or you can follow me on the screen just so you know. I did want to provide just a chart of where, where I've raised money, where I've gotten money from, just so you know I'm serious. Uh, and, I, and also I'm making a point here when I have the chart for 2018, 2017. You have a variety of funders, and not all of them, but a variety of them that I've raised money from. But you'll notice here that you'll see a variety of numbers here that I've raised from a variety of uh, funders. 18,000, 72,000, 50,000, 10,000, 7,500, 9,500, 10,000, and then you got a big one in 150. Uh, you'll see the program success there. IP means the program is still in progress. The reason it's still in progress is because our fiscal year begins July 1st and July 30th, which is coming up in three months. So it's still in progress. And I have projected our particular success. It, either it's going to be exceeding expectations, which is EE. 
is going to meet expectations or I don't know. So for the most part, um, we're going to exceed expectations and I probably should update that chart because we owe a youth by Capital Workforce Partners. Uh, we just learned that we have overachieved and we were given additional money to serve more kids. Um, so we are doing quite well. In 2017, we did the same thing. The chart is a little bit more dense. In 2017, you can tell it's a little bit more dense. We have more funders. Again, I raised $1.3 million. Same concept. Uh, you have the list of funders, you have uh, the projects, you have the amounts. And what you'll notice about 2017 is that those particular resources were multi-year grants, which is probably where you want to try to be, but there are different strategies when you get a multi-year grant versus a single-year grant, and they have different value points uh, that matter. But you can see for Strive Fresh Start in Waterbury, we raised $540,000. Uh, neighborhood Builders, which was a pretty big deal for us, raised $200,000 free and clear. Uh, producer found a couple years ago raised $150,000, etc. And again, you see some smaller funders in here. And what you might notice is that some of the funders repeat year after year, and that's strategic. And so we may cover that today, but you should probably notice that. Now, quickly about this course, this course is for you. You obviously registered, you searched this, you found me on Facebook or some other mechanism. It's for executive directors, CEOs, people who are interested in writing grants, helping their organizations that they care for. Uh, my hope is that you really connect with the content and that you see the value uh, in this content. Uh, it's for people also who are new to the grant writing process. Yeah, if you've never written a grant before, this is for you. And, and you know, while uh, if you have written a grant before, I have other courses coming up that will help you more uh, go down the road in a more advanced way. But if you just need to get your feet wet, this is for you. And this is also for organizations, again, who are looking to diversify their revenue streams. I'm a big believer in diversification. I do not believe in one stream of revenue. If you're just here just to get grants and that's it, that, well, you'll get something from this, but you're not going to be extremely successful. And I'm going to encourage you to diversify as as much as possible. What we'll learn today is what's associated with the competition of grants. It's huge. There's a whole lot of competition of grants, how to stand out in a grant application. We're going to review a standard grant application. We're going to go over some tips and tricks. And then, yes, I'm going to share with you some grant databases. Again, I ask you to save your questions to the very end. I have provided paper uh, for you to write stuff down. So please use that as much as you can. But before we get started, I do ask a favor. I do ask that you take a photo with someone you don't know, maybe someone you do know. Take a selfie. I need you to tag your friends, your mama, your daddy, your cousin. Tag me with the information on the screen. Let them know you're here. I want you to make people jealous and let them know they should have came, even if they registered. And if they didn't register, too bad, it's their loss. So we need to create some jealousy in the room. So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to take photos, tag me, let people know where you're at. Sure. If you're not comfortable with sales, you might want to get comfortable with sales when it comes to grant writing. All you're doing is selling yourself on a piece of paper or an interview. This is a quick, easy way of preparing yourself on what sales look like. A couple more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, thank you for doing that. Now, I do want to set the stage for what you're getting ready to get yourself into. Across the United States, there are 1.5 million nonprofits, churches, etc. I'm not going to focus on Connecticut, not going to focus on your city. Think about this. Around the country, 1.5 million institutions who are doing similar things you're doing or some variation of it. The competition is significantly stiff around the country 
for resources that are limited. In 2010, nonprofit organizations accounted for 9.2% of the salaries taken home. The biggest employer in our country is the federal government. Second is the private sector, and third is the nonprofit sector. And I point out the 9.2% because it's, it's a significant number to say that a lot of us who work in the nonprofit space, we matter to the economy. But if 9.2% of us are getting paid from uh, our nonprofits, our churches, our schools, et cetera, and it's 1.5 billion, you gotta imagine what the competition is like for existing resources. As of March 2015, there are nearly 323 congregations in, in America. This includes all types of houses of faith. That means you're competing for individual contributions. While you may not think you're competing with a Muslim place of worship, a Jewish place of worship, etc., or a Christian place of worship, you are competing for butts and seats. Butts and seats equate to, obviously, whatever your belief, belief is, some sort of afterlife. But before you get to the afterlife, a butt and seat represents a dollar amount. You are competing for conversion. Those are terms businesses use as well. Even if you own a clothing store, I own a clothing store, I'm competing for footsteps into my store, and I'm looking to steal whatever competition that you provide. It's the same way when it comes to faith-based organizations as well. 21% of our revenue in our business, our marketplace as nonprofit community comes from contributions, gifts, and government grants. 21%, over 70%, comes from program service revenues, which includes government fees and contracts. This means if you contract with a DCF, DLC, or any other governmental entity, there's a contract in place. You earn revenue by way of a contract. And the reason I wrote my green book sustainable is because of the 6%. 6% of revenue comes from fundraisers, events, other revenue. I don't know what you see, but when I see that 6%, I see huge opportunity that's been untapped and underserved, which is why Sustainable was written. This huge opportunity, and it is well beyond chicken dinners, it's well beyond cupcake sales, Girl Scout cookies, car washes, etc. Don't mean to step on toes, but it is a real thing. It is beyond that. Typical revenue streams you see in a nonprofit, service revenues, government contracts, contributions, gifts, dues, special events, etc. These are the typical amounts that we see. So why do leaders turn to grants as a part of their revenue? You guys are here, you guys have been searching for grants, you've been applying for grants because it's a familiar source. Everybody associates grants with a nonprofit. Everybody does. And dare I say, one of the benefits a nonprofit has is it's able to earn revenue and it's able to receive contributions and it's able to receive grants. These are benefits that businesses, for profit businesses, cannot take advantage of. A nonprofit is a business, it can earn revenue, it can turn a profit. You cannot keep the profits as the operator of the nonprofit, but it can turn a profit. The pros and cons of obtaining a grant uh, opportunity. Number one, you can launch your nonprofit immediately as soon as you get a grant. As soon as you get the letter of acceptance, as soon as the first check comes in, depending on the strategy you're using, as soon as the first check clears, you can immediately launch and explode your nonprofit. The second benefit is it can lead to significant growth and get this exposure. It's not enough to get that measly little $2,500, $7,500, $10,000 grant. That should not be your goal. Your goal has to be more revenue, more exposure. And dare I say, it's all about the money. It's not a bad thing if that's what you're all about because it means something. And lastly, when you get your grant uh, funding, it, you, uh, the qualifications for funding is made known up front. Now, if, if you ever apply for a uh, uh, a loan for a business or personally, sometimes you are surprised by the stipulations or the qualifications or the fees that you were not told about or told of in the beginning. 
typically in a grant situation, what's expected of you is said up front. The qualifications are made known up front. Funders have no interest in baiting and switching you. It's pretty clear what's expected in exchange for this money. Here are some cons though. It's very competitive. No matter what city you're in, what state you're in, it's extremely competitive. The dollars are shrinking. It's, it's shrinking parallel to the growth of the number of nonprofits in our country. So the competition and the landscape of available dollars is shrinking. This takes me to my second point. Availability of money, uh, monies are shrinking because funders are saying, I want to give less and I want to see more, and they want to see more of this. Number three, they want to see a higher rate of partnership between nonprofits. There are too many nonprofits doing, quote, the same thing, and funders are saying, I'm not going to give you 50,000 and you 50,000 and you 50,000 and the three y'all operate on the same block in the same community. How about y'all figure it out and I'll split 100,000 between the three of you guys. That changes the game tremendously. It's a con, but it's also a benefit if you know how to work it. And dare I say in this room, I said this last week, I say this everywhere I go, there's money in this room. And I'll go into that much, much deeper as we continue to go forward. Why should you pursue funding for your nonprofit? It's one of several revenue streams that can launch your nonprofit or support you going forward. You need income to do what you do. The project you're working on, the things you give away, does not generate revenue. You need revenue to operate a business. The grant is your source of revenue. You're asking a funder to be your underwriter as opposed to exchanging a service for a dollar amount. Without revenue, you cannot pay your bills. Your lights cannot turn on. Your rent will be due. Your people will not receive a paycheck. There will be no overhead costs, no health care coverage, no retirement, no nothing. You need revenue. The availability of grants can help you get where you want much faster. It's cool that you take a tenth of your salary and give it away or use it for some sort of project purpose. But when you think about the current limitations of your income and what 10% actually represents, whether post or pre-tax, you can only help but so many people. Really, you can't help that many people, you can barely help yourself. So you need grant revenue to accelerate your ability and span your past capacity to serve more people, to do greater work, to do more work. The question you should be asking me is, how do I stand out in a grant application process to earn a grant? Number one, you got to differentiate yourself. You can't say the difference is I'm blue and they're red. No, there has to be something special and unique about your nonprofit. We do this through the grant application process, the writing process, the idea generation process. I'm going to invite you to go through this exercise for a few minutes. This is an individual exercise. I encourage you to take this exercise seriously. There are two exercises in this workshop because they frame your thinking on how to get to the right place when it comes to grants. There are three things that are essential to standing out, and I can't stress this enough. I can't yell it loud enough. I can't put it in bold and red enough, but there are three things that I found to be extremely successful in obtaining and earning a grant. Number one, relationships. It's not about who you know, right? People always want to juxtapose who you know versus what you know. But relationships is really a reflection of the expansion of your ability to deliver. Who you know represents who can help you get the job done. Who can introduce you to opportunities. Who can introduce you to a potential population group that you can serve. Who can introduce you to revenue sources that you've never heard of. As I said, there's money in this room. I've shared with you how much I've raised. Relationships matter. One of the things that I tell people all the time, and one of my personal secrets, and we don't do a lot of this in Connecticut, but uh, I brought this from Philadelphia to Connecticut, and that is I love, love to have coffee with people. Because coffee is a cheap date. Mm -hmm. It's a dollar eighty-nine, wherever you go. It's a cheap date to get to know you. What's your name? What, you, what are you about? What are you doing? What's new? What are you working on? How do kids, etc.? It's an opportunity to get you out of the office 
and to introduce myself to you and figure out where we might align. Relationships matter. Number two, information. What do you know? What skill set? What competency? What leverage do you bring to the table? You can't just bring a passion. You have to have a skill, an ability, something that makes people say, if you need that, you need to call so-and-so because they are really, really good at that. Number three, you need capacity. If you think you can run your nonprofit, your project by yourself, hashtag you are sadly mistaken. You need a team. You need staff. And don't tell me you got volunteers. Please don't do that. <laughs> volunteers are unreliable. Family, they are unreliable unless they are paid. You need paid staff who are financially obligated and dedicated to your work. But as she's doing that, what did you learn about yourself? What did you learn about the relationships you have and don't have? What's the truth? There are a lot of people that you can tap into. There are a lot of uh, opportunities to build relationships. Say more about that. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if I think of my role in the community with, as, as a teacher, I'm connected with hundreds and hundreds of Educators, who have some providers, money. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and there's money there to tap into. There's, yeah. there, there are opportunities. They know people who know people, and they're, they're building what you said about building relationships. It's like about strengthening what you already have. Yeah. What did you learn about yourself when it comes to relationships? <laughs> I want well, you. Me? The the look. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself? I I don't know, like I have the relationships there, just me being able to speak. Like when I'm in a room people, I like want to be in the corner, I don't want to talk to nobody, but I know a lot of people that can assist that. You just want to be in a corner. Yep. Mm. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What I was going to say is, um, <clears throat> for me, I work in a huge medical facility, mm -hmm. and the department that I'm in, I'm responsible for like 300 doctors yeah. and being who I am spiritually, mm -hmm. I'd be down there praying with them, mm -hmm. I'd be ministering to them, I'd be telling them what my vision is that the Lord has given me, what I desire to do to, not so much as for me, but just people, because I'm a people person, I love people, I love helping people, mm -hmm. and I believe that when the time is right, all this that I'm doing is a preparation period. Because not just that, I work with the doctors, but I work with the residents and the fellows. I work with the, um, the different um, college professors and the deans of the different colleges. And that's my vision. My vision is bigger than what I see. So we're drawn in, and a lot of times people forget that. It's not just about the inner city. There's people in the outer city that need help too. For me, I'm thinking spiritually and networking together. I got something to give you that you may need. If you have something that can give me that may, I need to help somebody else. Thank you for that. Let's move to the next tab, and that is information. What did you learn about yourself when it comes to information? When it comes to information? Like yeah, what information? Skills and such? Yes. What information do you bring to the table, to the marketplace? What did you learn about yourself? I learned that we, I need to do a better job at quantifying what we already do. Hmm. Um, just because, uh, speaking from a church standpoint in our community, like, we have access to people, but, you know, we take for granted some of the things that we do, so how can we quantify to give them the information that we need to get what we need to do? Hmm. Very interesting and insightful. And someone else, what have you learned about yourself when it comes to information and skill? When you took this survey, for, for, for skill set, that I'm an excellent writer, okay, policy writer, okay, because they're still being used today. Okay. And, and okay. Okay. Thank you for that. What about capacity? What did you realize about your capacity or the lack thereof? Talk to me. I don't have any. You don't have any. It's just you. It gets tiresome sometimes. Right now it's just me. Yeah. And it's something that um, she said too. Um, we have to 
sell ourselves. Put ourselves out there. Mm. And don't be afraid. It takes guts. Don't be afraid. But act in spite of the fear. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, sometimes it can be fearful, but that's where the capacity comes in. That's where the help comes in. It takes guts to sell yourself. For some reason, in our business, and when I say our business, I'm talking about the faith-based nonprofit business, we are pressured to believe, quote, humility is the name of the game. That selling yourself makes you stand away and apart from the rest of the group, when the reality is, in any business, sales doesn't come from osmosis. There has to be a selling of oneself, a selling of your program, your people, your skill set to make it real. I was terrified up until probably September. Uh, I was one of those people who believed for a very long time that I did not want to be one of those Instagram or Facebook people that looked like they had everything going on, but it was fronting and faking because I, I really can't stand that. So I was also the hater in the background, like, well, you know, you don't drive that car. Get out of here, man. So there was a turning point, um, and, and I was sporadic, but there was a real turning point late last year for me when I said, well, I need to stop hating on people, and I just put myself out there. Because people kind of, I mean, they knew I was Dr. Clark, but they, a lot of people who were friends with me on Facebook really don't know me. So I started taking pictures and, you know, just posting stuff of what's going on. And I was so surprised at the reaction because a lot of people said, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know that you were doing this, this, and this. Because in my circle, people know. My com business community, they know. But people don't know until you put it out there. Right now, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're at the nonprofit center. Right now, 75 Charles Avenue. Down the street is the Hartford Downtown Library. Anybody from Hartford here? Here, okay. And uh, if you're familiar with the Downtown Library, there's a cafe uh, in the library. It is uh, operated by Billings Forge. It's another nonprofit not too far from here. Uh, so that's kind of a factoid that you should probably know. UConn is uh, kind of placed in the Hartford Library, right? That's another factoid. But one fact that you don't know, I'm going to tell you now, is that my nonprofit uh, is in partnership with Billings Forge. So if you ever go to the cafe and you see young people behind the counter taking your order, making your food, checking you out, cleaning the space, those young people, nine times out of ten, were recruited by my staff. So we cooperate in a sense, that business. It's been, an, it's been an amazing journey. That's the grant we got last year for 150. That's been doing really, really well. We've exceeded expectations. We've changed the game, in my opinion. There was this innovative approach that we took. And so everywhere I go, I share this message of, one, we don't operate a program out of the library. You know what I tell people? I'm hiring. Mm -hmm. Every four to eight weeks, I'm hiring people between the ages of 18 and 24. You want to know why? Because they go through my training program for a week, and then the next Monday, if the young person makes it through, they are starting a job where they're getting a paycheck every two weeks. That changes things. And I think this gets us to the next phase of our conversation when it comes to innovation. But before we get there, I do want to run through a standard grant application. There are about five parts here, so bear with me. Um, and I'm just going to just quickly breeze. I might stop for a moment and explain some of these. But number one, you need to have a legal name of your organization. Uh, you need to come up with a good name that not, not necessarily defines your project, but defines the work you're trying to get into. I'm the vice president of strategic initiatives uh, for a nonprofit called Career Resources. I mean, kind of self-explanatory. We help people with career resources, right? So you be, need to be thoughtful of that, you need to have a phone number. Please do not, uh, my recommendation, do not use your cell phone number. If you need a corporate number, one of my favorite apps that I use, and services that I use is called Grasshopper. You might have heard the commercial, but you can get a 1-800 number or a local number. It's a corporate number you can create. It's a small fee per month, but it rings to your cell phone and every cell phone you care uh, to tap into when a call comes in from my team, what we're going to be doing. Every one of my team has an iPad across the state of Connecticut, and we will have one phone number with 10 extensions. So you pick the extension and relevant to the person that you want to get in contact with in a particular city. And, and, 
grasshopper.com. So be thoughtful of that. The third thing is an address. Don't use your house. Uh, don't use your basement. Use a facility that is known as a business. It could be your church. It could be a school. It could be a place like this where I pay rent uh, to rent up an off, rent out an office. Have a professional address uh, that can be used so people know when they visit you, they can come to a professional environment, right? Or you can conduct services or provide programs out of. It might be a good idea to have uh, pay rent, so be thoughtful of that. Key contact person, is it you, the CEO? Is it your COO or some other responsible person who's going to get this, take the phone call and get this, respond to emails in a timely manner? Next, what's the mission and purpose of your organization? Some of this stuff is gonna be redundant, but it's for a purpose. What's the mission and purpose of your organization? What geographic area do you serve? Yes, I know you serve a specific city, but is there a specific community? And that specific community may be relevant to a specific funder. I get money to serve people all over the city of Carford, but there is one particular funder that wants me to serve one particular block. Geographic area, geographic. What geographic area do you serve? Okay. And so for that funder, that's what they want, that's what they're gonna get. Uh, the number of individuals you're gonna serve annually, back to your point about quantifying your work, it's a big deal. I recommend being thoughtful about how many people you can serve. I'm gonna drop a factoid in here. This is where partnerships come into play. If you are smart, and I'm gonna believe that you are, partnerships can expand the number of people you can serve if you can figure out how to align your services with their services. You don't have to do it by yourself. Next, the number of employees and their employment status, full-time, part-time. In some cases, in many cases for funders, this can be projected or actual employees. So you don't have to have the whole crew hired. You may have people identified that you plan to hire once the funding comes in. And then lastly for 1A, board composition. I will tell you right now, you need a diverse board. If you have an all-white board, an all-black board, an all-male board, all-female board, it is gonna be looked at and not favorably. You're going to have to work with people from diverse backgrounds, diverse genders, diverse everything to represent the people you're serving because funders want to invest in diversity and they can ensure diversity by who is on your board. Part 1B, is this for a new program? Simply yes or no. The amount of money requested for this program and for which program year. I am currently in the 2018-19 program year for my organization, but for the funder, it may be the 2019-20 program year. You just need to sync up the calendars and figure it out. But what program year is this money going to be applied for? Because that's going to matter from a programming standpoint, from a service standpoint. How many people are going to be served within that period of time from April until March? or from July until June, or from January to December. It's gonna matter, it's gonna impact your numbers. Your organization's total budget, this came up last week, your total budget is not the amount of money you're requesting. Do not believe all you need is just $10,000 to operate this program. That's a lie, that's not true. It does not cost $10,000 to operate a program. Maybe for a project, <laughs> not a program or a nonprofit. You gotta pay for your people, their salaries, their retirement, their health care insurance, you gotta pay for yours, you gotta pay for rent, you gotta pay for water, you gotta pay for utilities, you gotta pay for uh, laptops, internet, cell phones, uh, what else do you gotta pay for? Talk to me. Paper if you use it, pens, tabs, uh, 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 sticky tabs. I mean, it costs money, what did you say? Transportation, mm, okay, I'll give you that. Transportation, and then not to mention the actual program itself. The bulk of the program is gonna be operated by people. That's gonna be the operators of the program. But what if you give away stipends? What if you give away care packages? What if you give away bus passes? What if you give away stipends for housing, et cetera? That's a part of childcare. That's a part of the cost of the program. Your total budget is everything. So please, not for everybody, she mentioned food, because some funders will not allow you to use their money for food. But the point is, what is the total cost to do this? It is not that number you have in your head. That person on your job that makes $60,000, that's not the total cost of the business. They're over $100,000 easy. Insurance alone. 
vacation days alone, not to mention the desks, the chairs that they use, the bathroom breaks, the smoke breaks, the breaks they take when they shouldn't be taking breaks, that costs money. <laughs> costs a lot of money. I will say this, and I don't want you to forget it, a nonprofit is a, is what? Y'all gotta yell this out loud. I mean, I know we ain't in church, but yell it out. A nonprofit is a, y'all are kind of tepid. A nonprofit is a, business. you gotta operate it like a business. What is your proposed budget for the project you're requesting for this particular year? Not your total budget for the business, but what is the projected budget for this project or program? CRI, where I work, we have multiple programs. There are separate budgets for my portfolio versus my colleagues' portfolio. My portfolio is a little over maybe a million and some change. My other colleagues has a budget of, I don't know, 2.5 million. Others have other millions of dollars that they're operating. What's the budget for that standalone program that you're asking for funding for? The, your fiscal year, for me, it's July to June. Some people do January to December. It doesn't matter, it has to be on a quarter system. Figure it out for yourself. A copy of your 501c3 letter from the IRS, if if you're looking to become a 501c3, if you have not done so, hit me up after the workshop. I know a guy that can get it done that's fairly cheap but very fast. If not, you're going to have to do your own research, find somebody who will charge you arm and a leg to get that status. Signatures of key staff members and board members, an action plan, a strategy document, an approach. I'm a strategy guy. There has to be a strategy for everything that we do, not just for our program, but for everything. Where is your strategy? I, I encourage you to document your strategy before you even apply for a grant. I don't know how many times I wrote that in the book. I, I, I might have said stop and do a plan first multiple times because it's worth the energy to do the plan first because the plan directs the process of applying for a grant and the language you decide to use. A narrative to answer a series of questions. This is going back to grade school. You are going to be going, writing a lot of paragraphs, explaining yourself, articulating yourself. Now, I know we're used to a text messaging social media world these days where you just hit the number two to say two. You're going to have to write out four sentences to explain yourself and articulate what's in here and what's in here. And put a topic sentence in a paragraph and stick to that topic. That paragraph. Standard grant application part two. A brief summary of your organization's history mission and goals. If you're starting a new nonprofit and you say we have no history, we don't know what we're, you know, where we're coming from, one secret is to realize if you are the founder, your passion areas, what you've done personally, mm -hmm. what you've done with your family and friends for free under the radar, that's the history of the nonprofit. Leverage it. Take advantage of what you've done. Those baskets you give away to the homeless, the people you help get housed, the women you help get off the street, the kids you help, who you help get something to eat, that matters, your history. And if you, do I have it here? And maybe I'll cover it later, but I'll say it now. If you're trying to figure out what data you need to articulate, you may not have captured data, think about it in percentages. It's gonna be hard to think about it in numbers if you haven't kept up with that over the years. Think about it in percentages. Number two, description of programs and accomplishments. Again, if you have this, awesome. If you don't, think about what you've done in the past. Number three, the population, the agency benefits, socioeconomic status, the demographics, the language, the ethnicity. Questions at the end. Questions at the end. Okay. Can, can you write it down? Yeah, thank you. Write it down. Uh, physical abilities, the descri other descriptions as, descriptions as appropriate for your group. How this agency uses volunteers. While you cannot operate your business on volunteers, you do need some. So how do you strategically position them to help expand your program? Got an email randomly last, uh, earlier this week from a guy who wants to volunteer. I get those quite often. And for me, because I have a solid staff, it's incumbent upon me to figure out how to deploy this person as necessary so that they don't disrupt my flow. It's good that you want to volunteer, but if your volunteerism doesn't help me make more money, serve more clients, become more efficient and effective, and you just want to be here for a photo op or just to tell me what to do when you don't do this full time, it's not really helpful. 
It sounds good to say I want to volunteer, but it's like, it's like, hey, we all church folks, you a church person? It's like having a mean usher. <laughs> like, I appreciate you volunteering to open the door for people, but if you have a style on your face, like, no thanks, let's just let people walk in without all the meanness or the mean parking person. Like, it's, it's mm, no thanks, it's not cool. So volunteers aren't always great. Um, how this agency works with others providing similar services. Remember we talked about partnerships. You gotta know your competition. Who are you competing with? Who does similar work that you do and do you guys work together? It doesn't always work out, but there might be some people you work with that you get along with. You need to articulate that story. Part 2B, how often did the board meet? Okay, the type of internal financial controls, do you have that? Submission of the most recently completed audit, financial audit. What if financial information is given to the board and how often is it provided? And what is the process you use to annually evaluate your ED? Your CEO, your ED, if that's you, you need to be evaluated by your board to determine your performance level, to make sure you're still competent, to make sure you're still good at what you do. Uh, part three, statement of community needs and issues to be addressed. Let me just pause here for a moment. I appreciate, I think funders appreciate the feel-good stories. Everybody has a story of a person that they helped. There's this one kid, there's this one woman, there's this one family that when they received XYZ from our organization, it just changed everything. Everybody has that compelling story. That does not tell the full story of the work or the need or what's missing. Retain those stories when you need to pull a good story out of the hat, but you need to justify the need for the money. I don't raise $1.3, $300,000 because of a story. There's a justifiable need for the work that we do. We serve a number of populations, people who return home from prison who need work. We serve single moms who need work. We serve young adults who are considered opportunity youth who need work. We serve mental health, uh, pe people who have mental health challenges who need work. We serve veterans who need work. We serve people of color who need work. We serve people who have a certain socioeconomic status who needs work. And there's data to justify every population group that we target. That type of effort in understanding your client and your customer, your non-paying customer, is the key, one of the keys, to unlocking a successful grant opportunity. If you can't find that, the funder is not going to give you money. You gotta know this information. I hope this is sinking in for you guys. The description of a project goals for which you want, uh, uh, for what that you want to achieve. What are you trying to accomplish? It varies from organization to organization. For me, I need to, what I'm trying to accomplish is graduate people from my job training program, help them overcome barriers that they are, are going through, and help them find and retain employment. Three simple yet complex things to do. What are the goals of your program or your organization? You need to know what you're trying to accomplish. Project description, including objectives, activities, time frame, number serves, frequency. Back to the planning process. If you can tap into a theory of change, that's probably something you need to write down. A theory of change a chart. I talk about it in the book. The theory of change chart helps you walk through in intellectually all of that key information of who, what, why, where, and how. Take the time, go through it. Remember we talked about the key, the purpose of relationships. You don't gotta do this alone. Ask your family, your friends, coworkers, parishioners, people that know people to come to a writing party to help you gather some information who know stuff. Because if you ask me for information that I know, it's nothing but a thing to sit down and share with you everything I know in five minutes. I can save you a whole lot of trouble. If you want to come to Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, Waterbury, New Britain, Norwalk to do workforce development, to do strategy development, leadership development, growth marketing, business development, take me out for coffee and pick my brain and ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. It's the same concept in your network. Your people know people, they know stuff. 
I'm going to tell you like I told the group last week, if you don't know what your family or friends do professionally, shame on you. There are people who are doing some amazing things professionally and you don't know what they do. There are people like me who don't put that stuff on Facebook, but you should know. There was a group, this is a story I didn't share last week. There were, there's a group uh, that I was a part of and you know, I was new to, to the city, to this area and I was trying to just connect and meet people. And at that time I was near done with my doctorate uh, and I got it probably a couple months after I moved here. And then my career was still on an incline. And I decided to volunteer my time with this group. Now I figured being someone of color that they can relate to, you can tap into me. Like, hit me up, just ask me for what you need. I can give you what you need and take the credit because I don't need it. I don't need validation. I don't need the security. Do you know I've been part of that networking group for four years and they have yet to ask me for critical information that can make a difference in raising money and stability? And when I've offered information, it went on deaf ears because I wasn't part of the in crowd. Shame on you if you don't know who knows what and who knows what to do. Shame on you if you don't use free information or for the expense of a cup of coffee and a bagel. Those people, we, we church group, right? I, I didn't come in to preach. There was a, Bible, there was a, a morning devotion I did a couple weeks ago. And um, Ecclesiastes 9, 10, or 11, I forget. And, and it goes like this. Uh, there was a small city with a few people. And a king from a major city came to destroy that small city. And from that small city, everybody was scared out of their boots, shaking. But in the city was a poor, wise man. And that poor, wise man, through wisdom and information, was able to save an entire city and thwart the attacks of this major city, this king. But after it was all over, this poor, wise man went back to being the nameless wise man and nobody remembered him or his story. Mm -hmm. Now, you can take the victim role and say, I'm that person and I know stuff and people push me to the side and nobody calls me, but let me just flip this around for a minute. How many poor wise people do you have in your circle, on your Instagram, on your Facebook, on your Twitter, in your church, in your community that know something you don't know? Mm -hmm. And how often do you ignore that information that's deep-seated inside of them? but only for a cup of coffee would they unlock it and unleash it. In your network, there's money. There's resources. There's information. Who's gonna benefit, number four, from your work? How do you plan to evaluate success? You need to know what you're doing. Number six, list of key individuals who are involved in a project. Seven, evaluate results. Number eight, long-term strategies to keep it going. You can't just focus on right now. You gotta worry about tomorrow, five years from now, 10 years from now. Part four, budget for this grant request. How many times have we said budget in the past five, 10, 15, 20 minutes? Money matters. The, the funder wants to know how much income and expenses. Funding sources. One of the critical elements in the book that I cover is that funders do not want to be the only funder of your nonprofit. You must have multiple funders. Why? Funders do not want to be responsible for your organization shutting down if they pull funding because of lack of performance or change of priorities. You got to have multiple streams of income. It's like having one parishioner giving you all your offering. <laughs> let them get sick. Let them get mad. Let them leave. You're screwed. Yeah, that's true. Good luck. Number three, your annual operating budget and actual income from expenses. Let me just tell you, cash flow is critical to your business. One of the cons about getting a grant is that depending on the size, it may be delayed. Many grants operate on cost reimbursement. That is a problem. That means your nonprofit must have credit or cash to front the business for the first 30, 60, 90, 120 days. That's no different from a for-profit business. As of right now, TRI is a $10 million nonprofit. We have $1 million of outstanding revenues that's due to us because of cost reimbursement. We're doing quite well, but a million dollars is owed to us. And at any given time, it's possible for us to miss payroll if we don't get the infusion of cash. So cash flow matters. How is the cash going to flow into your nonprofit? Do you have a line of credit, a credit card, or other cash to front the business? Another secret. 
large dollar amounts are typically cost reimbursement. Why, and I'm gonna, this is a tip that's in the PowerPoint, I'm gonna say it now, celebrate all income. Because the $150,000 or $300,000, that's sexy, right? Man, I, I, I took a picture of the check, it was on my Facebook from 2017. I was looking sharp in my suit. Big old check, $200,000 with my colleagues. Man, that was a case where the money came in immediately. $100,000 for one year, next year. That's not normal. Typically, there's a cost reimbursement associated with large dollar amounts. Dollars like $75,000, $25,000 typically, a funder for that amount is saying, here, here's the check. Give me, real, give me a report at the end of the year. You don't want to despise the smaller amounts because that could be the difference of paying payroll or missing and bouncing checks. That could be the difference of paying rent or being kicked out and embarrassed. So you gotta celebrate all revenue sources. Number five, most uh, recent financial statement, audit it if available. Uh, part five, last but not least, your org chart, who's on your board, copy of the IRS letter, annual report, letters of agreement, memorandums of understanding. Again, if you don't have relationships, go develop them. They do not pop out of thin air. They don't fall into your lap. You have to be intentional with relationships. Sometimes it will take you a year of coffee to get somebody comfortable with you to say, hey, I want to do business with you. There are people I meet with every month around this area in New Haven and Bridgeport and Waterbury just to say, hey, how are you? I don't need anything from you. Don't want anything from you. I just want to make sure we're good because when opportunity comes, guess who I'm calling? Mm -hmm. If you don't have relationships that are text message relationships, you're screwed. What do I mean by text message relationship? If I can text someone and they respond, we're, we're pretty good. Yeah. You can email me, I'll respond next week. You can Facebook DM me, I might respond in a month or two, but if you text me and I respond within five, 10 minutes, we're good. That's the type of relationship you need. Lastly, copy of your organizational insurance, you need liability insurance. I wanted to share um, the backdrop of the cafe project I was talking to you about down the street, the library. This is about innovation. This is going to lead us into our break as well as our next activity. I told you the end, somewhat the end of it, but let me tell you the beginning and why I'm so uh, critical, uh, focused on uh, planning, strategy development, and innovation. We started out um, this time last year, probably February of 2018, and we got wind, um, January 2018, got wind of this new funding opportunity. And I was having coffee with this particular funder, unbeknownst to me, she says, you should apply for this particular funding. Okay, wait, wait a minute, we never thought about it, never considered it, cool. Can't tell you how important coffee is. I've earned I aimed this woman's respect, appreciate her relationship. And this is the second time I heard about this funding, but she is the one releasing the money. She said, you should apply. When you get those type of, you know, those, those head nods like, <laughs> I, you know, I ain't gonna say it, but you know, you should apply, right? All right, great, so we started thinking, then finally everything came out. In the book, I talk about the importance of attending bidders conferences. You really should get the book, I keep talking about it. But talking about bidders conferences, it gives you secrets on who's in the room and what's what. Once we got to the bidders conference and the RFP was released, we went through a writing session. And we came up with this idea of, okay, we're new to the space, or at least this particular funder, we've never operated this grant before, and we just wanna make a, a good impression. What do we wanna do? So after reading the grant and we figured out, okay, we wanna do a couple things. Number one, we wanna do an I-84 project. Now for us and our clients, no matter who our clients are, one of the biggest barriers to employment for all of our clients is transportation. So we said we wanna do something workforce related that's close to mass transit. Where I come from in Philadelphia, mass transit is plenteous. Mm -hmm. Bus, rail, train, bike, pigeons, dragons, we take it, we can get anywhere. You come to Connecticut, we just got CT rail. I mean, and really, it doesn't really have a benefit until you get to New Haven, Bridgeport, where you start to go into the city in New York. The rest of Connecticut is a little shady. The closest thing we got up here in this area is called the fast track. 
it's, it's intended to replicate kind of a speed line or a speed, uh, uh, air, you know, kind of like a, um, a mass transit part of the highway, only buses can travel down. So we said, okay, we want to recruit people who can get to the 84 corridor, which is where Fast Track exists, and where employers exist on an 84 corridor, which means that as long as an employer is within walking or biking distance or a cheap Uber ride from a bus stop, that person can get from point A to point B, and point B being employment. Cool. The second thing we thought about was we are okay at case management. Our skill set as a company, or at least my department, is training. We're, we're really, really passionate about training. We're good at it. Don't, you know, hands down, we can train you out the, out the door, right? But we're okay at case management, but we're required to do it. So one of the things we said, how do we get better at it? Because we don't have an MSW on staff. We don't have a licensed social worker on staff. Although I'm a doctor, my doctorate is not in anything relevant to that. So I can't apply that knowledge of case management. So we said, let's do it relevant to our other competency, and that is workforce development. We decided to create a program or some sort of experience where we're doing placed-based case management or employee, employer-based case management. The reason why we did that, for a couple of strategic reasons. This is where data comes into place, and this is where networking comes into place. Uh, businesses around Connecticut, particularly manufacturing businesses, they're aging. Connecticut is an aging state. People are aging out of the workforce, retiring and leaving, therefore creating gaps of employment in the state of Connecticut. This means employers are desperate for new bodies to come and fill the vacuum and keep it going. If you didn't know, Connecticut is what's considered the, the home of mom and pop manufacturing uh, facilities. So there's a huge level of opportunities for brown people, black people, and people who have low income status to find stable employment without a college degree. The problem is the employers typically are white. They don't live in the inner city or the urban centers, as I call them. Urban centers include Hartford, uh, New Haven, Bridgeport, Waterbury, New Britain, etc. And then the employees that they want to target are people from the urban centers people who are living in those same cities, there's a culture clash. And what happens is the white employer says, I don't understand employee A, and therefore I don't know how to relate to him or her. And then the employee says, he don't understand me, he's racist. How do you bridge the gap? There's a problem here. Because the employer wants you at work at six o'clock in the morning to start on time, yet the employee gets to work at 6.05 and doesn't see the big deal. Huge issue. This is where we come in. We train on those things, those minor things that make a difference. But we realize that's not enough because there still can be a miscommunication between the two. So we said, as a part of our proposal, let's start to go to the employer. Let's start to close down our offices and start to work at the employer location. Hence, place-based case management. What we do at the library, if you ever come during the week, You'll see one of my staff, and you won't know their staff, they're sitting in a corner behind a tree, and they're on their iPad, and they're observing our young people. They're observing exchanges and interactions with customers, with their boss, with their other coworkers, and we're taking case notes. The reason we do that is because we can personally observe with our own two eyeballs what's been going on, good, bad, or indifferent. So when there's altercation, we know how to deal with it, both from the employer side and the job seeker side, therefore removing any barriers that gets in the way of someone retaining employment. Now you don't have an excuse to quit. Now you don't have an excuse to fire him or her, and we can figure out how to bridge it. So that was the second innovation. Third innovation, we wanted to transition our training to an online career development software, and that's been going pretty well, a little slow, but we proposed that. And then lastly, our leadership academy. So again, we train, we can train the doors off of, uh, the hinges off a door, whatever you want to call it. We're good at that. So we just said, let's just do something a little different with that. <sighs> that was a lot. That was the idea. What actually happened was we did write that proposal. There were two parts to it. And the partner we were courting to do part two, which was the employer piece, backed out on us two weeks before the proposal was due. There was no way to recover because that partner had the employer relationships we desperately needed to make it work. That was devastating. I was mad. I was pissed. 
all that coffee I spent, no. <laughs> we were disappointed. After wrangling back and forth, we decided to go for one part of it and just go for it and see what happens. The reason I tell you I plan everything is because stuff happens. I realized, remember that $200,000 I got? So you had the big old check? I had to go to a conference as a part of receiving that money the week this grant was due, all the way in Tennessee. So I was gonna be away, I couldn't help finish the grant, and I was gonna be an hour behind. So I had my staff prepare in my absence to get everything done. We have a grant writer on staff. And I said to my staff, I want you to help her any way she needs it. This is important because this is an innovative idea. We need to do this. And I told my staff, I want you to be there when it's time to print the application because we needed to print 10 copies of this multi-page grant. It needed to be uh, signed, I believe in blue, by our CEO. And it needed to be delivered on a Tuesday by 5 p.m. Our grant writer said, well, I don't need your staff help. They don't need to help me to print and bind stuff. That's easy. Oh, no. Now, the Bible says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. I'm not your pastor. I'm just quoting scripture, right? And I think at times people over... There you go. They overestimate their capacity. And they underestimate the what-ifs. That day, the printers decided to not work. That day, she, had, she came into work late. She had a lot going on with her twins. That day, there was chaos in the office. And guess where I was at? In Tennessee. I had this person go pick up this, uh, that go help. This person that I sent to help was actually the person who I wrote into the grant because this was his promotion. So he had a vested interest. He got there and he helped to do simple things like print and staple and bind. Mm -hmm. And what was said to me after it was, wow, I didn't realize how much help I really needed that day. Thank you for doing that. Plan everything. I don't care what people say they can do. There needs to be a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way through Z. You could send it to Staples, but if you don't have the money to pay for Staples to print everything and bind it, you're gonna to have to figure it out. But the story doesn't end there. The person that was slated for this promotion, the person slated for the promotion did not get to the office. He didn't get to the office in the morning because he had an accident on the way to the office and he nearly died. So let's, let's reverse. The person who's going to get promoted die, almost died getting to the office and could not go and help. My backup went to go help. It doesn't change the impact of the story because the fact that this person almost passed away, delayed getting to the office, didn't get everything that needed to get done, crap happens. So then my backup person got it, the stuff into the car. He had to call my other option and say, meet me halfway as I gotta go pick up my son from school. They meet somewhere in Middletown. They transition documents. She speeds on the way to Hartford to drop off the document at four something in the afternoon. Now, I tell you the story because crap happens. If you don't plan out every element of the work, it does not matter that there was an accident. Mm -hmm. It does not matter that he almost lost his life. It doesn't matter the printer decided to not work. It doesn't matter you ran out of staples. It doesn't matter your ink, uh, your blue ink ran out. If you don't have it in by five o'clock, to be fair, I cannot consider you. And I had some legitimate excuses. Long story short, obviously we got the grant and we're killing it, but man, that was tough. There needs to be a process to it all. And if you don't have one, if you never thought about it, I encourage you to think about it. I want to share a couple of tips and tricks, three of them, and then we're going to take our break. Number one, some of this I've, I've shared with you 
engage in the team writing process. For that grant I just told you about, when we wrote the grant initially, it was the first time my team ever wrote a grant. Now, I've only been here for two and a half years, and they've been sheltered. So I'm the guy, and I'm the leadership guy. I expose everybody to everything. I just remove the curtains. And I engage them in a the writing process. A writing process is when you look at a question, and you look at the question that's being asked, and you ask everybody, what do you think we should do with this? The best idea floats to the top. Or maybe there's a combination of ideas that you bring together to get the answer that will wow the funder. Number one, use your team. Your team is your best asset. I can't tell you how many times I rely upon my team. It don't matter who I am. Yes. Dr. So-and-so, who cares? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't even say anything because the best ideas come from, quote, the poor wise man. Use your team, use them often, and then lastly, in the case where you're launching something new, use family and friends. Shame on you if you don't know what your family does for a living and you don't use them. Number two, celebrate grant awards big and small. I shared that with you. They matter. A $7,500 grant can be the difference between you pay, meeting payroll or not paying your salary or not, paying your car note or not, paying the car note of your key secretary or not. People will quit if you miss a paycheck. Yes, they will. They will quit. Those big ones and those small ones, they all matter to meeting your budget. The $2,500 grant is just as important to meeting my million dollar budget just as the $500,000 grant. Every penny matters. Number three, be aware, but don't be a scaredy cat of, the op of, of competition. Just because somebody's bigger, badder, better than you've been around logging than you does not mean that you need to be a punk or you need to be scared. Be aware, but don't be weary of. Don't be afraid to compete. You have nothing to lose. You don't have no grants anyway. So why not throw a Hail Mary and see what happens? 